Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our, our webinar this morning, um, Lipid-Based Nanomedicines, Challenges That Lead to Solutions. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Marcel Bally from BC Cancer Agency here with us today to, to present some of his work and, and join us in a Q&A afterwards. Um, Dr. Bally is the head and distinguished scientist of the Department of Experimental Therapeutics uh, here in Vancouver, the BC Cancer Agency. So before I introduce Dr. Bally further, before we get to that, though, we would just like to let everybody who is here in attendance know a, a couple of other items. One is uh, we will be hosting a larger symposium, uh, so a half-day event uh, titled Introducing RNA Medicine in a Pandemic. And so this will be taking place June 23rd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, so uh, from a little bit earlier in the morning here on the Pacific, uh, Pacific Time. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you will receive an email. Everyone who attended today will receive uh, information for registering for, for this, uh, or you can look at the Precision Nanosystems website to find out more. Likewise, if you're attending today, you will receive an email with a link to today's recording, uh, which will be made available uh, likely by the start of next week. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bally. So Dr. Bally uh, has focused his career on the development of much needed novel drugs, uh, drug combinations and drug delivery systems, particularly designed for use in patients with cancer. Dr. Bally received his bachelor's of science degree as well as a master's of science in biology from Texas A&M University and went on to complete a PhD at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of British Columbia. He's been recognized for his expertise in pharmacology, toxicology, drug formulation and preclinical cancer models. Um, is qualified to conduct preclinical safety studies under good laboratory practices and has also completed training in good manufacturing practices. His scientific work uh, has been cited over 23,600 times um, and he's trained over 65 highly qualified personnel, many of whom now high, hold significant positions in industry, academia, and medicine. Uh, and he's also been a serial entrepreneur, having co founded multiple companies, including uh, Lipex. Uh, now acquired by Northern Lipids, Inex, now known as Arbutus, Northern Lipids, uh, which was uh, renamed Transfera, purchased by Vonic uh, a few number of years ago, uh, Celator, now part of Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and most recently, Cupris Pharmaceuticals. So to date, all these efforts have resulted in three marketed drugs, Myoset for metastatic breast cancer, Archemo for relapsed ALL, and most recently, Vixios for uh, high-risk AML. So Dr. Bali, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited for your presentation and I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I don't have to give a talk after you that introduction, it's great. Um, so uh, I, this is my first webinar, so I hope people can put up with uh, the presentation as it goes forward. Uh, those people that have seen me present before have uh, an understanding that like to do interactive talks, but that's not possible today. So I'm just going to run through the presentation. And then as Tim indicated, you guys can ask questions as needed, and hopefully we can address all of those. I really am going to talk about um, some of the history behind some of the therapeutics that we have developed here in Vancouver that have actually been approved uh, for use in humans um, and some of the challenges uh, that were associated with that. Uh, so that sort of organizes my talk. Um, instead of an outline, I'm going to outline the challenges that uh, I've been faced with. Um, and these are statements that uh, have been written to me or have been said to me uh, over the many years that I've worked in this field. Um, it starts with, that will never work, or you can't do that, or perhaps you should choose a different field of research. That one hurt. It is all based off this idea of the KISS principle. So it's this idea of keep it super simple. As you increase the complexity of your uh, product, uh, you're actually introducing a number of other features. And that really makes it much more difficult to even consider the uh, possibility that the product can actually be developed for pharmaceutical use. To illustrate that point, I wanna look at some of the very early um, formulations that proved to be successful. Uh, at least from a liposomal perspective, and that concerned liposomal doxorubicin formulations. If you look at doxorubicin, it's a chemical. It's uh, naturally produced by bacteria um, and uh, easy to uh, make and synthesize and produce. 
It does come with some extenders like lactose, um, but relatively simple product, a single compound that you need to be able to analyze and uh, to qualify. If you look at a couple of different liposomal dot servicing formulations, one's called Myoset that was developed here in Vancouver. The other one is called Doxil, which was developed by a group in California. Uh, you can see how just by introducing the liposome, which is a um, uh, structure that's formed from phospholipids and um, cholesterol, that you've increased the complexity. So mine is pretty simple. It's really just a phospholipid plus cholesterol. Um, and uh, we created something which was a three vial kit. And I'll talk about that in a bit more because that adds another layer of complexity that we didn't consider. Doxol is a bit more complicated because they introduced polyethylene glycol to the surface of the liposome. And that polyethylene glycol, uh, again, is something that has to be chemically characterized. But they, one of the advantages of their formulation is that they have a single vial. So that speaks to this sort of generic idea of liposomes. And I talk about the plain liposome, which is just a liposome with a drug associated with it. You could make it more complicated by adding an antibody. You can coat it with a, um, a polyethylene glycol, a polymer, to uh, change the surface properties. You can have the polymer plus the antibody. You can now start introducing at the last most complicated formulation um, different drugs, uh, different peptides associated with the surface, genetic material, whatever you want, it makes it a much more complicated uh, formulation. These complicated formulations are the ones that actually get a lot of academic attention. They're actually funded and people get quite excited about them. And I found myself more recently being um, a person that was very negative about them because they're almost impossible to consider development. But I think that's the challenge I would want everybody here to address. So the complex nanomedicine side of things is exactly what it is. You can be very, very proud of what you are doing and what you've achieved, but you really need to watch out where you're heading. Otherwise, you're going to run into trouble. So let's start off with a bit of the history, and I'm going to link this back to a Gordon Research Conference that I attended uh, back in 1984 when I started first talking about the liposomal products that we were considering. And it was based from experts in the field indicating that will never work. And that really triggered the Lipex story, the Myoset story, and the Markibo story, which I'm going to talk about briefly here. So again, the liposome is a small spherical structure um, where you have a lipid bilayer surrounding an aqueous core. You can put a hydrophilic compound into the core, or you can put a hydrophobic compound in the acyl uh, chain of the bilayer. Um, that's not exactly what you make when you make liposomes. Uh, and I know precision has a slightly different um, approach here where you're taking lipids that are formulated in uh, or mixed in a solvent system, and then you dilute them in the aqueous buffer, and that creates uh, a, a structure that you can move forward with. In the old days, we would take lipids and we would dry them onto a surface and then uh, add water and shake. It was very simple, and you created these things called multilamellar liposomes. And that's illustrated by a freeze fracture, electron micrograph, and an illustration. Uh, each line on the freeze fracture graph you'll see is, is a lipid bilayer. And uh, each of those lipid bilayers are separated by a channel of uh, aqueous fluid. These are really easy to make, uh, easy to move forward, but not very pharmaceutically useful because they're heterogeneous, they're very large, um, and uh, just not pharmaceutically suitable. So one of the first innovations that we needed to address was this idea of taking a multilamellar liposome and making a more defined structure, this unilamellar liposome uh, shown here. And that innovation was built off of some work that was being done by a group in California, but uh, was made more practical by a uh, big group here in Vancouver. Um, and this really speaks to the work that was done in part during my PhD thesis with Peter Cullis. And, um, uh, using a device uh, where we could actually put multilamellar liposomes within the device, uh, put large or high pressures uh, uh, on top of that. You can now push those liposomes through polycarbonate filters at the bottom, and those polycarbonate filters had defined pore sizes. If the pore size was 0.1 micron, for example, the liposomes coming out at the other end were about 0.1 micron. 
this whole technology was based, as I said, on, on something which was developed in California, but they used the device where the maximum pressure that they could use was about 20 PSI. Uh, and uh, that meant that you could only use very low lipid concentrations and it was a very, very slow process. So if it was, uh, you know, um, you were working at a time when you wanted to go skiing, you could actually start your extrusion process, go off skiing and then come back later and the extrusion would be done. Uh, that was not suitable for Peter. Uh, he really wanted things to be done a little bit more rapidly and came up with a brilliant idea of just upping the PSI. If you upped the PSI, you had to change the chamber that you used for making the extruded liposomes. And that really led to uh, this uh, approach where you could take um, multilobular liposomes and create unilobular liposomes at very high lipid concentrations. And that's illustrated with this freeze fracture electron micrograph. These are pharmaceutically suitable formulations and fully scalable. The device that was developed, it was uh, uh, incorporated in, in a, a company called Lipex Biomembranes, and Lipex Biomembranes produced the extruders. Their initial extruders were uh, for research purposes, 1.5 mil and 10 mil. Eventually, we saw that there was greater need for the larger volumes, 100 mil, and then we started scaling up for um, early phase clinical trials where you start thinking about 800 or 1.5 liters as being sufficient for early phase clinical trials. These were easy to maintain. You got high traffic efficiency, you use high lipid concentrations, low operating costs. Um, and uh, although it's not illustrated with this particular diagram, um, this particular picture, uh, there was no volume uh, restriction. Uh, Lipex uh, Biomembrane started uh, with the idea of just uh, producing product for research purposes, um, but we found that people were actually using this for um, many, many more uh, reasons as the technology moved forward. Uh, you can see that uh, the need to have more scalable systems uh, is present. Lipex Biomembranes was eventually acquired by a company called Northern Lipids, which is another company who started here in Vancouver. Uh, Northern Lipids um, uh, was eventually acquired by Avonic, um, and uh, Northern Lipids uh, uh, still, well, uh, Northern Lipids, Avonic now still sells the Lipex extruder, and that's illustrated here with the uh, different uh, volumes that we have, the 10 mil, the 100 mil, and the 100 mil extruder. Um, these are fully scalable. Um, even the, these ones are suitable for lab scale and perhaps um, phase clinical trials, but the system is uh, scalable up to these uh, uh, diaphragm pump extrusion systems where you can produce six liters per minute at, uh, at fairly high volumes uh, and is suitable for your GMP manufacturing. So this was a good innovation, as we mentioned already uh, in 2016, Vonic signed uh, an agreement to purchase Transfera, which was uh, Northern Methods, that's the company Northern Methods became, and Northern Methods acquired uh, Lipex Biomembranes in, 19, um, in 1991, uh, and Lipex Biomembranes was formed in 1983. So you can see a bit of history there, um, and it's a device that is still being used today. So it really was a requirement for more innovation as we move forward, um, and it really spoke to the idea that this was not a very practical technology. You can make liposomes with pairs, you need to be able to put a drug inside the liposome pouch. So how can we do that? And that is something that came out of my PhD thesis as well. And uh, it really started with a uh, project trying to uh, um, prepare liposomes which had a high ingredients to the cost. Uh, if you had a liposome that had an iron gradient, you needed to be able to measure whether the iron gradient was there on the table. We talked to somebody that was an expert in uh, mitochondria, and they said to look at uh, iron gradients in mitochondria, you use this dye called saffronin O. You add the dye to the cells, and then it becomes concentrated in the mitochondria, and you can see them, and that's a reflection of the iron gradient that's there. So we just took that same approach and took the saffronin O and added it to liposomes which had an iron gradient, in this case, the sodium potassium gradient, we added uh, something that would uh, facilitate formation of that, bolinomycin. And as you added the bolinomycin, you saw a decrease in absorbance at 520, an increase in absorbance at um, 470. This change in spectrophotometric characteristics was really associated with the movement of the saffron from the outside of the liposome to the inside of the liposome. 
it actually became much more concentrated and that concentrated form exhibited a different spectral characteristic. I was presenting this information to a collaborator of Peter's, um, uh, Dr. Ben de Gort, um, who was here in Vancouver visiting us. He had been working with Officer Robertson for some length of time, and he just made the simple statement that Daphne and Oak look a lot like the therapeutic Dr. Robertson. So it was a very simple step to ask whether a therapeutic like Dr. Robertson would behave the same way as Daphne and Oak. Turned out that, that was the case, and it's illustrated here. Uh, with this um, idea of another good invention, another good innovation. Uh, in this case, the ion gradient was a pH gradient, a proton ion gradient. You could prepare your life zones in a low pH environment, exchange the outside pH to a higher pH, like 7.5. Then you could add noxorubus into the outside of those life zones. And at the neutral pH, noxorubus is in this. Uh, in a fair proportion as a neutral form. The neutral form can cross the lipid bilayer and concentrate on the inside where it becomes protonated and charged. When it's charged, it cannot cross the bilayer and it's trapped. To illustrate the trapping efficiency that you get, you can take doxorubicin and add it to preformed liposomes, and within minutes, you'll see 100% or close to 100% of the drug associated with those liposomes. Um, and uh, again, this is a good innovation, certainly useful for the creation of um, Mimeset, which is a drug that's been approved uh, and is used in Europe for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. You can see in this cryo EM micrograph the liposome, but within the liposome, you see these large crystal structures, which are electron dense. Um, this just illustrates that the amount of drug that you're loading inside these liposomes is so high that it actually is beyond the solubility characteristic of the drug and it forms a precipitate. This would not be that great of an innovation if it only worked for uh, doxorubicin, but the technology works for any compound that has a potent immune function. The next drug that we actually started focusing on was a compound called vincristin, which is um, another commonly uh, used anti-cancer drug. Uh, it is, uh, has a protonizable amine function. In the end, we ended up trapping uh, vincristin inside liposomes, which were prepared out of single myelin and cholesterol. Again, fairly simple liposomal formulations. We could add the vincristin to the outside of the liposome as a function of time. Vincristin would uh, incorporate itself into the inner core, uh, forming a product that we could make. And that is the Mark Evo product shown here. For both Myoset and Mark Evo, we chose to develop a product which was based off of the three bile kit. And the three bile kit was one where you would have liposomes at a low pH environment. You'd have an alkalinizing agent which you could add to the liposomes to increase the exterior pH. And then you could add the drug to those liposomes. The drug would then become incorporated in the liposomes and you would be ready for administration of the drug. Uh, to a person. This is actually a very simple approach, but what we didn't recognize is that the uh, it's uh, from a pharmacist perspective, it's actually quite complex. So the desire to have a simpler single bile approach uh, really is a preferred approach, and it's something that we have to think about um, as we uh, move forward with other products. Again, it's just an illustration of how something that may seem very simple to you in the lab turns out to be quite complex from a development point of view, but also complex from a pharmacy point of view and from the use point of view. So I think there's some time for some more innovation here, and that really arose out of the work that uh, we were doing with Oxford and Ben Kristen, um, and the understanding that when you're treating patients with um, cancer, you're never treating them with a single agent, and that the most effective treatment is the use of combination therapy. And that really is one of the drivers for the development of these very complex multifunctional delivery systems where you may have a liposome which would contain a therapeutic but also have a ligand that would target the cancer cell would also have something that you could image so that you could prove that the compound is getting where you want it to, to get something that would indicate that the compound inside the liposome is actually being dissociated from that liposome and having a, a specific therapeutic effect. So again, these are very, very attractive, but very, very complicated and very difficult to develop. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do this. And one of the things that we did as a group uh, was to start thinking about putting 
a simple combination chemotherapy together. And when we did that, we started this in the context of the company. We created a company called Celator Pharmaceuticals and we were placed, I would say, both academically and commercially with a pretty simple statement. You can't do that. So with that in mind, we can talk about the Vixio story. The simple drug combination product that we were contemplating here was really simple. It was just taking liposomes with drug A and drug B. There's two concepts that we could pursue, a liposome of drug A, a liposome of drug B, and then they get mixed into a single vial. Or you can take the two drugs and put them inside a liposome to create your combi plus is what we call the co-formulator product that could be used for uh, use in patients. So this is the approach that we ended up pursuing. You can't really pursue anything unless you can get some intellectual property around it. And uh, we need to figure out how we could protect the technology as, as we move it forward. And that arose naturally out of data uh, that was being collected. And how well those two drugs work from using combination. And that really what arose out of these synergistic drug combination screen, where you look at the activity of drug A and the activity of drug B, and then you mix those drugs at different ratios, and you look for the therapeutic activity of those drugs at those different ratios. And therapeutic activity in this particular example is just the MTP assay, so you're looking at a viability assay. And what you can discover is that drugs, the same two drugs, being used at one ratio showed much worse activity than the same two drugs at another ratio. And that could be um, measured using this calculus and software that we use still today, uh, where you could look at whether a drug was additive, which is a straight line here, antagonistic or synergistic. And again, importantly, drugs at one ratio were antagonistic, drugs at another ratio were synergistic. This information that was collected in the dish didn't require any uh, drug delivery systems. It's just the drugs mixed together at a defined ratio. But what it did tell us is that in order to have optimum therapeutic activity for a pair of drugs, you really needed to have those drugs uh, available in vivo at a defined ratio. And that's the technology we ended up protecting. To illustrate that just with one of the formulations that arose out of this um, uh, cell for exercise uh, is uh, CPX351, which is basically Vixios. And um, I'm going to show this graph over here, which is looking at the plasma concentration as a function of time after administration of these two drugs that we put in those liposomes, cytarabine and donorubicin. And you can see that the ratio of the function of time of this formulation was essentially maintained at close to 5 to 1 um, after administration in vivo. So these are chemically distinct pharmaceutically distinct compounds, each with their own unique biodistribution and pharmacokinetic characteristics, and we could get them to behave as one by putting them in a liposome. Perhaps what was most important was the uh, efficacy data that was being collected with this uh, formulation that we looked at survival in this P3A tumor model, treated three times. If you left them untreated, those animals would die within nine days. If you treated them Treated them with the optimal dose of liposomal donorubicin, you would see survival up to 20 days. The optimal dose of liposomal cytarabine, um, you would see about 10% survival. Using the drugs in combination at their optimal dose, you could see about 20% survival, but when you went with the CPX, it's on 90% survival. I think what's most important here is with the recognition that when using the free drugs, which actually gave us worse activity, we're using 50-fold higher doses of cytarabine and two-fold higher doses of donorubicin. So even though CPX351 was given at a much, much lower dose of drugs than the free drugs, it was much more active, and that really defines synergy and an optimal combination effect. The product did go forward to phase one, phase two, and multiple phase three clinical trials. And this is just an illustration of one of those um, clinical trials in AML, where you could see that patients that were being treated with the Vixios product were doing much, much better than those patients that were being treated with the um, standard of care, which was the exact same two drugs, uh, cytarabine and donorubicin. Those promising clinical data ultimately led to a company called GS Pharmaceuticals, 
range sales growth for $1.5 billion. Um, and I uh, guess now is marketing uh, the Vixia product. Now, as all this stuff was going, um, I was faced with these criticisms academically that it was time to pursue a different research field. And that really arose out of the fact that a belief, the general belief that life is only formulations were not achieving what uh, we had promised. Uh, I always argued against that, um, suggesting that we were producing products that were being approved for clinical use. Um, and that is uh, the best that I could hope for from an academic person. So with this idea that we should choose a different field, we just head on forward into formation of another company, Cooper Pharmaceuticals, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Metaplex story. And I'm not sure what drug this is going to become, but it will become a drug. So how did this arise? It really arose out of our use of metals to help formulate uh, therapeutics. When we made the Combiflex formulation, what we recognized is the need to actually have two different mechanisms for drug loading. Uh, when using the and we knew that we could load Oxfurvitin and sublipsomes through the use of a pH gradient, but we also could use the ability of Oxfurvitin to bind metals through uh, ligands that are known to chelate the metal. So that's a metal compensation reaction. So what we did want to do is establish whether this metal complexation reaction could work with compounds that didn't express an immune function. And there are a number to pick from. I'm going to talk about the names of these uh, specifically now. But one of the things that was very unique with these metal drug complexes or metal ligand complexes is that they're almost always uh, water insoluble. And that's illustrated here for uh, copper sulfate, which is in solution, which is nice and clear, but you add it to these different drugs and you form these really, really ugly precipitates. We simply asked the question of whether uh, if we had liposome and copper inside, uh, could you actually form these complexes if the ligand was able to cross both the bilayer? And we used a number of examples, copper uh, diethyl dithiocarbonate, homogen, erythrone, hydroxychloroquine, bifenol. Um, we have illustrated this now for probably more than 30 compounds. And the approach is very simple. You could take uh, copper, um, add the ligand or the drug to it, it would form an insoluble precipitate, which is unuseful from any therapeutic uh, perspective. But if you take copper and put it inside the liposome, it doesn't have to be copper, but a, a metal that can bind a, a ligand, and then you add the ligand to the outside of the liposome, it can cross both the bilayer and then form the complex inside the liposome. And that is the metaplex uh, complex synthesis and solution that we came up with. To illustrate how this works in terms of the metaplex technology, we have, again, I said over 30 compounds, which is the five compounds where you look at the increases in inherent solubility, which are many, many log order improvements in solubility as we use the metaplex technology relative to the free ligand or free drug. Because we're using liposomes to do this, we know that when the ligand or the free drug is in the metaplex formulation, we extend the circulation. We look at the plasma drug levels in much of the time, comparing the ligand drug by itself versus the metaplex formulation. And these formulations, uh, similar to um, other formulations we talked about, the metaplex formulations uh, are therapeutically superior to the um, Formulations that are not formulated using the Metaplex uh, technology. So it is a platform technology. We have uh, a, a variety of uh, activities in the cancer and the immunology area and in the infectious disease area. And for a variety of reasons, which I'm assuming many people will know, we are now um, uh, almost totally focused on coming up with solutions for. Uh, uh, products that would be suitable for treating uh, patients that are affected by COVID-19. This is Cooper's. Uh, uh, Cooper's Pharmaceuticals is uh, working with partners to provide the technology that can create the best in class animals. And if anybody out there is interested in discussing our technology, we'd be more than happy to talk to them about that. And it probably should be stopping here, but I'm going to talk very quickly about the Nanomedicine uh, Innovation Network which again arose out of this idea, perhaps we should choose a different field. Peter Cullis leads this nanomedicine innovation network, um, but I think he would be coming back and he, he started it probably perhaps for a different reason than 
you should choose a different field. But the same principle here is um, this is good technology and we need to develop more of it. And um, this innovation network is an interface between academia and um, you know, formation of companies and so forth. It's successful. It's funded by the National Centers of Excellence. We received almost $20 million. Peter is the scientific director. We have an associate director, Gilbert Walker, uh, who is in Toronto, and an executive director, chief analyst, um, uh, helping make sure that the whole thing is operational. It arose out of the fact that um, many of the technologies that are approved for use in humans have been touched by people here in Canada. Many of those are touched by people here in, in uh, Vancouver. So we certainly talked about uh, Myoset, we talked about Marquito, we talked about uh, Vixios. Uh, Peter's group uh, was instrumental in the formation of um, Patro, which is a genetic medicine to treat a rare genetic disorder. Through that whole effort, we also formed companies, and this sort of uh, establishes the number of companies that are in the now medicine area. Every colored product here, including precision, uh, was formed by uh, the founders and the principals of the nanomedicine initiative. The mission is very simple. We're going to develop therapeutics and diagnostics, commercialize those, and make sure that we train people so that we have a uh, workforce uh, available to work in the nanomedicine industry here. There are three themes. There's the targeted drug delivery theme, the gene therapy theme, and the diagnostic themes, and we're hoping to work together if you need more information about the nanomedicine uh, innovation network, the contact information is on this slide. At this stage, I will thank Precision for uh, supporting programs like this, which is talking about the nanomedicine area. I really like their um, idea of creative transformative medicine. This really is talking about more complex solution. Uh, and I always come back and say complex solutions are difficult to formulate, but perhaps the precision systems that they're developing are providing a solution to allow us to do these complex formulations uh, for which we're cutting. At that stage, I'll end with my concluding slide, which is this one. When you are in deep trouble, say nothing and try to look like you know what you're doing. Uh, and with that, I will... Um, Great. Well, thank you uh, once again for your time, Dr. Bally, and thank you for everyone who tuned in and stayed with us. We've had a great crowd here and a lot of uh, lively discussion, both on the chat and Q&A. And so uh, for anyone who's signed up, uh, you will get a recording of this, uh, we expect, by early next week, and we will do our best to follow up with all the questions that we didn't get to. Thank you again to everyone, and thank you one more time, Dr. Bally, for joining us. Thanks. We'll talk again later.